Musical, linguistic Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon. And uh, in case you've been wondering where I've been these past 10 days, I'll uh, tell you all about it after we first listen to this lecture by Terence McKenna. Uh, and in it, he's going to give us a survey and a history of psychoactive plants around the world. You know, in past podcasts, uh, I'm sure you've heard me mention the fact that during the 1980s, uh, Terence McKenna's workshops were... Well, they were just about the only source of information about psychedelics that uh, actually reached the streets. While there was uh, some information about psychoactive plants, uh, actually quite a bit available in uh, professional journals and uh, university libraries, it took Terence to pull out this information and uh, repackage it for the rest of us. Now, the workshop that we we're about to join took place in June of 1989, which was 25 years ago, in case you don't want to do the math yourself. This talk begins with Terence discussing the fact that, well, at least back in 1989, there was very little effort being made to preserve information about the Amazon rainforest, uh, information that had been discovered and compiled by the indigenous populations over several millennia. And as to uh, whether that situation has improved, well, I'll leave that up to you to decide. But should you decide that uh, there is still not enough being done to gather this valuable information while we still can, well, then, uh, perhaps, just perhaps, uh, maybe you should be figuring out how you can do something to improve the situation. And now, here once again is the Bard McKenna. I'm sure you're all aware of the situation of peril in which the Amazon rainforest finds itself, and very large conservation organizations, uh, such as the World Wildlife fund and uh, and that sort of organization are working very hard to preserve large tracts of the Amazon in situ and to essentially make large parks and this is commendable and should certainly be done but what is not being done is an effort to preserve human information about the rainforest in other words, no effort is being made to conserve the heritage of the people who have lived in and adjacent to the rainforests over millennia. And my estimate would be that this information, which is extremely fragile, will be lost by some time after the turn of the century. It's not hard to understand why this is happening. It's a consequence of the impact of market economies on primitive, so-called primitive, pre-literate tribal people in the third world. In the case of the Amazon, the men are leaving the remote villages and going to work in sawmills and going to work as outboard motor uh, captains and mechanics and uh, the kind of transformation that always accompanies urbanization and the arrival of a money economy is taking place. Yet these people have a body of medical data that is has served them very well over thousands of years. And now, because they can are impressed with the values of Western medicine and can buy all kinds of remedios, at any uh, drugstore in the city, why the the uh, importance of this knowledge is no longer apparent to them, and so it's being lost. Uh, I might just digress for a minute on that subject because I have a passionate feeling about it. Um, I have no reason to doubt the DEA statistics which say that 70% of the cocaine produced in South America is coming out of the Rio Ayjaga Basin. Uh, I know nothing about it. As a botanist, I can tell you that the Rio Ayjaga is the richest floristically, the area richest in plant species in the entire Amazon Basin. As near as we can tell, looking at the geohistory of the basin 
At times, it's been considerably drier. And during glaciations, when, when water is concentrated at the poles, uh, the wet, the high rainfall areas of the Amazon diminish in size. The Rio Huayzaga is one of those areas that is always wet. And it has consequently uh, produced a fantastic speciation of plants. Uh, one uh, biogeographer, geologist, estimates that the Amazon basin has been above water continuously for 220 million years. This is as long as most places in the world, longer than most places. It's estimated that the Madagascan uh, plate, which is a relic plate that now comprises Seychelles, Mauritius, and the Malagasy Republic, has been above water. This is all, we're talking Eastern Africa, Indian Ocean here. That land has been above water 350 million years and is the oldest above water sites on the planet. But the Amazon basin, by virtue of heavy rainfall, continuous uh, lack of inundation, and being uh, tropical, has been like a laboratory for speciation, both of animals and plants, so that the Rio Huayzaga, which is the concentrated center of this process, is like um, the most intense concentration of variegated species and genetic material on the planet. Well, uh, it should be made into a vast natural park. If that can't uh, be done, then it should be left alone. What the American government has decided is a better course is that it should be defoliated, that a chemical called spike should be aerial aerosol sprayed into the air over this valley in order to kill coca bushes. Well, I don't know who dreams this stuff up, but any one of you on the ground for 20 minutes in this scene would be convinced that nothing could be stupider, that this is essentially like burning down the forest to kill the ants, that uh, coca, there may be a lot of it there, I don't know, but there's a lot of a lot of other stuff there for sure, there are hundreds of distinct tribes, dozens of language groups, tens of thousands of unique species of plants and animals. It is floristically, faunistically, one of the five or six richest areas on the whole planet. And as if the inroads of capitalism and the inroads of Maoist politics and the inroads of capitalism were not enough, you're also going to get a bunch of clowns from the DEA who want to defoliate it. So, you know, if any of you have political pull or are the, the letter-writing type, uh, you might put some pressure uh, on anyone you know to halt this. This is really a kind of ecocidal atrocity, and if something isn't done, like all the other ecocidal atrocities, it'll be history before most people are even informed of what is going on. I mean, this is really uh, one of the great, great policy uh, wrong turnings for many, many reasons. I mean, I don't expect the State Department to be sympathetic to endangered plants, but what is happening is all of Peru is being pushed into the arms of Sindaro Luminoso, which is a one of the most peculiar and radical political philosophies on the earth today. I mean, it rivals Pol Pot for having a no-holds-barred approach to dealing with its enemies. And Peru daily is being pushed into the arms of this extremely radical faction by a combination of mismanaged uh, Peruvian economic policies and mismanaged American policies uh, toward the campesinos, toward the poor people who grow the coca, because uh, they are seeing Sindaro as their only protector, their only hope.
So it's a, it's a repeat performance of a sad story that has been seen in many parts of the world. Well, that's enough political polemics. What I thought I would do today is just briefly survey the world looking at the shamanic options in the plant area, trying to see just what is available, what are the history, chemistry, pharmacology, and botany uh, of the relevant uh, species. So I'll go through this. It's in the way of a survey. It's not uh, a rhetorical flight of fancy unless we lose control. Well, I've talked a lot about Africa in these meetings to set, talking about the emergence of culture and my belief that it was catalyzed into existence, language, and uh, and complex neural processing by exposure to psilocybin mushrooms in the Velt situation of ancient Africa. So I think I've said enough about that. What I would talk about today regarding Africa is the um, existing cults or patterns of hallucinogenic uh, or shamanic plant usage in Africa. Africa is a special case because uh, it is, of all the continents, the continent most heavily impacted by human presence. Because, of course, human beings evolved in Africa, fire was discovered and used in Africa before it was used anywhere else, and also the ecosystems of Africa had a particular fra fragility in relationship to the dryness that comes and goes with glaciations. So in spite of the fact that I propose Africa as the cradle of, of uh, human emergence under the influence of uh, psychedelic plant synergies, today Africa is noticeably poor in hallucinogenic plants. The most interesting hallucinogen in the African uh, situation is Tabernantha iboga. Tabernantha iboga is a tree uh, in the Rubiaceae, or a small bush, depending on edaphic factors, that means soil factors can cause it to grow different ways. Tabernanthi boga contains the alkaloid ibogaine. Ibogaine, there's a paradox about ibogaine, which is, of all the indole hallucinogens, it was the one most earliest to come to the attention of Western researchers. In the 1870s and 80s, when Belgium was uh, in control of the Congo and exporting huge amounts of ivory and gold uh, out of Africa, uh, entrepreneurs seized upon this plant, Tabernanthi boga, and created tonics where that were compounded with it as the main ingredient uh and it was sold as a tonic and an aphrodisiac and in some cases it was understood to be an intoxicant um much in the way that uh vina vini de mariani the famous coca preparation which was the rage in the 1880s in europe much in the same way that it was marketed, iboga tonics were marketed uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, but the alkaloid was never very thoroughly studied after the turn of the century. And of all the indoles, we know less about this one. It has a complex molecular structure, placing it closer in structural affinity to LSD than to any other psychoactive indole. It is, uh, yeah. Say what an indole is. Oh, in, indoles are a class of hallucinogens that are based on a um, molecular structure that involves a benzene group, which is a six-sided structure, attached to a what's called a pentexyl group, a five-sided structure. The six and the five. And then built off on them, there may be another six. That gives you the beta-carboline family. 
there may be uh, just a side chain that gives you the tryptamine family, or there may be more complex stereo uh, chemical um, attachments, and they give you the LSD ibogaine type structure. So indole refers to a small family of psychoactive compounds, not necessarily all psychoactive compounds, not opiates, not tropanes, which are the things in Datura, not uh, um, the polyhydric alcohols of cannabis, tetrahydro, uh, THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, but this particular small group of, of uh, plants united by this chemical structure that seems to, because of its affinities to serotonin, be the chemical structure that lays the basis for the most uh, psychoactive of the hallucinogens. Iboga is uh, used by the Fang people, most notably in Gabon and around uh, the capital city in Ghana and uh, in Nigeria and in Zaire. And it has an interesting and suggestive usage. First, let's deal with this question of aphrodisiac. As you know, an aphrodisiac is a chemical substance thought to make one either capable of or susceptible to sexual activity. And over thousands of years, this has been a recurring theme of fascination for human beings for obvious reasons. And the definition takes on different nuances in the hands of different people. Probably the best known af so-called aphrodisiac among ordinary folks is the so-called Spanish fly, which is cantharidine, the beetle, the um, carapaces of a small desert beetle can be ground down to produce to yield cantharidine. And if you give someone cantharidine in a carefully calculated dose, well, they have a generalized reaction to it where they can gain relief from this reaction by having sex, but it is not a true aphrodisiac. It's more like a, a, a almost genital itching or something. It, it's a strongly localized in the erogenous zone kind of itching. And so this is like a pseudo-aphrodisiac. All CNS stimulants, all central nervous system stimulants in low doses present themselves as what's called arousal. I mentioned this yesterday. Attention to incoming detail, uh, slightly elevated blood pressure, so forth and so on. This is a precondition for sexual activity, but it is not uh, a true aphrodisiac. In fact, when you sort through the many candidates for aphrodisiacs, and I'm sure, as you know, they range from powdered rhinoceros horn to mangoes to oysters to what have you, uh, interestingly enough, ibogaine is the only thing which actually seems to pass the test. Ibogaine is an aphrodisiac in the truest sense of the word, and I take that to mean this, that if you are interested in sexual activity, it promotes, facilitates, and enhances it. If you are not, it doesn't. It is not you know, it doesn't overwhelm the intentions of the user. This seems to be one pathway that the psychic energy that it releases can be shunted down, uh, but that there are others. Uh, and paradoxically, the way it's used in the Fang society is um, it's a major force holding couples together. Uh, Fang society is quite complex, and it's structured in such a way that there is a built-in high anxiety factor about women among men. The reason for this is an unusual set of customs which we don't really find duplicated anywhere else in the world, and it goes like this. A man may have more than one wife, 
a wife is always accompanied by a dowry. The dowry is always quite large in the sense that it is always a strain on the girl's family to get the dowry together. However, and when a woman marries, naturally, she and her dowry go to the village of her husband. But what is a little unusual in this situation is that divorce is very easy for the woman to obtain, number one, and number two, if a woman leaves her husband, the dowry must be returned. So men are in a constant dither about hanging on to women because the dowry must be returned even if it has been spent. And these are family relationships. These aren't relationships between a man and a girl's parents. These are relationships between two uh filial structures, so it can become quite complicated. And in fact, Fang men between the ages of 25 and 45 spend enormous amounts of their lives making journeys to the villages of their wives or former wives to negotiate dowry return because it isn't the concept of used goods is recognized. And so it isn't simply that the guy has to pay back the dowry. It's that he has to meet with the girl's family and argue with them about how much she was really worth. And this often ends in bloodshed. So into this social structure that is pre-structured for anxiety about women comes this psychedelic aphrodisiac uh, that promotes not only pair bonding, but community bonding. And in fact, it does so. And often when people are, the cult of Iboga is not the generalized cult of the Fang. They have many cults and, and do, and some are Baptists and Mormons. And But when a couple gets into trouble, the old men of the village, the shamans, will often say to them, why don't you join Bawiti, this cult? You're having marital problems. Why don't you join Bawiti? And perhaps you can avoid having to pay back your dowry. Perhaps your wife will reconsider and decide to stay with you. So it has actually become a very interesting force for social cohesion. And in fact, studies, sociological studies, have shown that members of the Bawiti cult have a divorce rate far below that of general Fang society. So uh, the, I spend so much time on this because this is a, an unusual role for a hallucinogen. We just don't see them playing these uh, secondary socially catalytic roles. Um, Iboga is a strong hallucinogen. And it's usually given to a person in very massive doses uh, at the initiatory exposure, which can come in late adolescence. People do die occasionally from it, but the amounts eaten are just almost beyond credibility or creditability uh, because they talk in terms of tablespoons and people will go to the river and eat two tablespoons Methods of preparing hauma and soma, which are very puzzling when you try to apply them to a mushroom, because there's all this talk about it's squeezed, it's filtered. A bunch of processes are described, which if you tried to carry them out on a mushroom would just leave you with a mess. Uh, but if you carry these processes out on pergamon harmala, it quite reliably produces a yellow fluid rich in harmaline, harmaline is yellow, uh, that is probably an intoxicant. So this is an area where research needs to be done. Any of you who are interested in ayahuasca or interested in beta-carbolines in psychotherapy, uh, I urge you to look at Flattery's book. It's brand new, 1989, University of California Press, Near Eastern Studies, publication number 21, Hauma and Harmaline. Okay, um, 
moving on east then across the Iranian plateau into India, which is certainly the birthplace or, or a great cradle of uh, esoteric spirituality, what we discover is a surprising poverty of true, i.e. indole, hallucinogens. There are interesting substitutes, aside from Pergamon Harmala, which I've mentioned, of which there is very little textual evidence for use in India. Uh, the two things which have to stand out in Indian um, uh, psycho-phyto-shamanism would be, uh, number one, detura species, and we might as well talk about them now because we will meet them in, on every continent, and they're including in Africa. I just read an article about a group in Tanzania, interesting group, um, Datura fatuosa, taken by women only, in a women's initiation rite, which, uh, I don't know how often this goes on, but it involves a labial measuring uh, rite. So everybody compares the size of their labia at the height of this trip. And <laughs> what is culturally sanctioned and this is a funny concept, which I'll talk about a little bit, is blue hallucinations. The women strive for blue hallucinations, and if they don't achieve them, it's considered like it wasn't really a successful initiation. And the anthropologist who wrote on this called this a culturally sanctioned hallucination. Well, now, I'm not sure what is meant here. Do they mean that or uh, anthropologists, white people, don't have blue hallucinations. They just have hallucinations, and that somehow it's expectation that directs this. I'm not sure. I don't associate blue hallucinations with tropanes, but it is certainly true that blue hallucinations attach themselves to ayahuasca. And people have even called it the search for the blue flash. And if you've ever taken ayahuasca, you know that there is a moment when what appears to be uh, the world's entire supply of magenta jello is unleashed upon you and just flows toward you, past you, and through you. And it invariably is this electric, cerulean blue merging into uh, magenta, a very typical presentation of that. Okay, well, detura species, many types, occur uh, throughout the world in the tropical and the temperate zone. There are several species in India, and uh, texts on yoga and on Indian spirituality never stress this. Use of detura is quite strongly a part of religious, of Indian, well, sadhu type spirituality. It's too much for ordinary people. But you do see when you hang out with sadhus, little, the little prickly pods of detura are as common to find cast around about their dwelling places and gathering areas as are uh, the evidences of charas smoking. And that brings me to the second major component of the psychoactive flora of the subcontinent, which is uh, cannabis. Cannabis is not an indole, but cannabis must be considered a, um, a, a psychoactive plant of great age and human association. I mean, uh, cannabis is hemp. Cannabis is the source of fiber for weaving, and we find uh, hemp and fibers in graves uh, eight to 9,000 years old at Chatal Hyuyuk, for one place, a, a place I've talked a lot to you about. Uh, it's fascinating the way in which the metaphors of the weaver are the metaphors for human cognitive activity generally. In the 50s, a famous book was published called Man is a Weaver that pursued this theme but never made the connection to fibrous hemp. But we weave a tale, we tell a yarn, 
We have all these words, these fiber and weaving words that we connect to poetic or narrative activity. And, you know, most of us who are aficionados of cannabis in these latter days smoke it. But, and don't smoke charas, uh, hashish, because it's rare in this country, but smoke uh, bud, uh, flowering tops of marijuana. But if you actually eat hashish, it, you know, you can convince yourself this was the LSD of the ancient world in the 19th century. You know, Theodore Gautier and um, uh, Baudelaire and Verlaine, Rimbaud, that crowd. Uh, there was this thing called the Society of the Hashashin in Paris, and they met at the old Hotel de Leon uh, uh, on the left bank uh, and ate jellied uh, cannabis that they were getting from Morocco with little silver spoons. And the descriptions of these experiences make it clear that this was operating. They're not more florid or less florid than the descriptions of LSD that we get from Aldous Huxley and Tim Leary in the early 1960s. I mean, this stuff was taking them away. Uh, I don't advise you to eat uh, hashish or charas for a very practical reason, which is it's collected off people's hands. And, uh, you know, the, your immune system is just electrified by the presence of, uh, all of this, uh, uh, material that's been rubbed off of your hands. I suppose we could put it through an x-ray machine and then we could eat it, uh, with impunity. But we can't sell short the spiritual power of cannabis, especially when eaten. Some of you may know this book, The Oracles and Demons of Tibet, by René Dinabisky Vojkovits. Vojkovits studied um, shamanism, was not interested in Tibetan Buddhism, but was interested in the pre-Buddhist strata. And in that book, there are pictures of Trungpa shamans intoxicated on hashish, uh, experiencing actually fits and near convulsions in an oracular trance uh, in a village uh, near Mustang. So uh, it is not a minor psychedelic substance at all. It's a very powerful psychedelic substance, especially when eaten and, uh, and when concentrated and then eaten. Opium is an Asian plant, but I'm not going to talk about it in the context of psychedelics. I think you know enough about opium and its history. What I will point out is the um, absence, the surprising absence of hallucinogens in the old world tropics. By the old world tropics, we mean um, the Indonesian tropics. This is an area that I'm very well familiar with from having spent a lot of time out there as a professional insect collector. Uh, in my, my pre-botany days. And um, there just are no major hallucinogenic plants in the Indonesian or Philippine or Southeast Asian tropics. There are certain suspect plants, uh, but none of them uh, do we encounter a living cult that would be a clue to this thing as a major item of human, spiritual, or cultural usage. Yeah, Marty. What are, the, uh, what are the magic mushrooms we hear about from Indonesia now that are available there, supposedly openly now, in omelets? And... When I was in Bali, this practice was absolutely unknown. This, the famous omelets of Denpasar and Kuta Beach and all that. And I think that until somebody argues differently, the most reasonable thing to assume is that coprophytic mushrooms, meaning dung-loving mushrooms, have just followed cattle around and around the world in the warm tropics. Now, the mushroom uh, that is most commonly offered tourists in Bali is not Stropharia cubensis. It's a Coplandia. 
and uh, it's a weaker mushroom. There are a number of these dung-loving mushrooms that contain psilocybin, but almost all of them also contain an emetic, usually, well, no, I don't want to say that. They just usually contain an emetic, means makes you throw up. The Hawaiian mushrooms that people rave about are actually, from the point of view of someone who knows psilocybin mushrooms, a very inferior choice. Uh, if you go to Thailand, if you go to Koh Samui in the islands of the south, uh, you'll be offered mushrooms. And I quickly understood that there was, a, to a certain degree, a shell game going on. And what it is is this. The, the people selling the mushrooms have learned from the school of hard knocks that it's a bad idea to wire up naive Westerners with massive amounts of hallucinogenic drugs because then you get in trouble with the local constable and so forth. So unless you are on it in southern Thailand, what they will sell you are mushrooms that have grown in the dung of water buffalo. And right there in the next field over, there is the dung of Cebu cattle, and that has Trophere cubensis in it. But they try to steer you away from that because it's so much stronger. They just want people to get a buzz on. So if you're, deal if you're buying mushrooms in southern Thailand, try to see, try to go with the guy and collect them and see where they're coming from. Now, there's an easy test to tell these uh, Paniolus and Coplandia species from Strophoria, they will do what is called auto-digest. Some mushrooms do this and some don't. That means if you pick the mushroom and lay it on the, in the sun on a stone, if you come back in an hour or two and it's turned to slime, it was not Strophoria cubensis. It was a Coplandia or a Paniolus. They... Uh, literally dissolve themselves at death. And uh, this is not a quality of, uh, of Strophoria. There's been a lot of wondering about this thing, about why are there no hallucinogenic plants in the old world tropics when in the new world tropics, the Amazon basin, it is the most concentrated ecosystem for hallucinogenic plants. Well, the thinking is the tropics are the tropics. Who can imagine a set of evolutionary factors that would favor uh, the evolution of many species of hallucinogens in one hemisphere, but not in the other hemisphere? It's very hard to picture a mechanism, a, a Darwinian or, or neo-Darwinian mechanism, that would give you that result. Uh, so different suggestions have been made. Uh, one is that um, actually there are as many hallucinogens in Indonesia as in South America, but because the Dutch have been there for 450 years, the level of indigenous culture, the primitiveness, so-called, of indigenous culture has been mucked with, and consequently the people have forgotten these things. Well, that's a good theory, but when a botanist who is not an ethnographer goes over the species lists and looks at the suspect families of plants, you also don't find hallucinogens. You see, certain families of plants are highly suspect for hallucinogens. For instance, um, the leguminosae. This is the family of flowering trees with finely divided leaves. This is a typical leguminous tree, this locust-like thing here. And uh, they, they occur all over the world as trees and bushes. This is a family that always has a, a very exotic chemistry, not hallucinogens per se, but flavonoids, saponins, terpenes, susquaterpenes, all kinds of exotic tertiary byproducts. A mimosa is a typical example. Um, another family that is uh, always suspect that you look at first is the rubiaceae. We know this as the family that contains tea, 
And, of course, caffeine is an alkaloid that is sequestered in the bean of this plant in surprising concentrations. But some of the Rubiaceae contain DMT and, uh, and other psychoactive compounds. Another family that is always uh, the, one of the first ones you check out are the euphorbs, the euphorbiaceae. These are the fleshy old world succulents that bleed latex when cut. They often have extremely poisonous or sometimes psychedelic principles in them. Okay, so much then for the old world. Uh, as you know, when there is ice at the poles, there are land bridges between Siberia and Alaska, and this is the route that most anthropologists believe the major migrations into the New World took. Well, now, an interesting consequence of this northern migration route to the New World, people didn't just set out on a trip from Manchuria to San Diego. This happened over centuries, millennia, that people would move a few miles and then have children and die. And, and so what it means is that cultures crossing into the New World had to go through a cold neck the neck of cold land, a, a, fun, a floristically extremely restricted environment represented by the Arctic tundra. And we can imagine that this would have stripped away many traditions of plant usage as they moved north out of the areas where these plants occurred. So, uh, well, the role of cannabis is not clear, but for instance, no opium was carried to the New World by these ancient peoples. Uh, and in fact, very few plants at all. Cannabis is the one slightly puzzling exception. It may be that cannabis was carried to the New World by people crossing the Siberian land bridge. Um, cannabis does grow in Alaska under special conditions in short growing seasons. And it's possible that this happened. Uh, the closeness between cannabis sativa, the Mexican marijuana plant, the, and by closeness I mean the botanical closeness to cannabis ruderales, the um, weed hemp of Central Asia, indicates that probably these things were separated not too long ago. What has happened with cannabis speciation in Asia, you see, is that... Um, obviously, even without the narcotic dimension to the cannabis plant, we can see that very early on there was pressure on it, uh, selective pressure by human beings to produce good fiber stock. So what you get in India is a division into fiber tribes and drug tribes in cannabis. And uh, the resin tribes are you know, extremely uh, selected, heavily selected for the production of resin, and they are the source of the narcotic charas. Uh, Amanita muscaria, the hypothesized mushroom uh, soma in Wasson's view, and for sure a hallucinogen of use in Siberia among the Ostiox, Koryax, Kamchatka tribes, and Yakuts, this whole group of people, and by a coincidence of uh, scholarship, uh, you know, when scholars study a worldwide phenomenon of any sort, they like to have a baseline uh, area to compare everything else to. This is why, for instance, the volcanoes of Hawaii are the volcanoes of this planet. All other volcanoes are compared to them. They are the baseline volcanoes. And the Hawaiian words for various lava types and this sort of thing have been adopted by volcanologists worldwide. So uh, all rough lava is called pahoi hoi. All smooth lava is called, I mean, is called a'a. All smooth lava is called pahoi hoi because these Hawaiian terms have been adapted. Well, a similar thing went on in the sh study of shamanism. Uh, 
Merciliad and other people were looking for what they felt was the pure, the original, the real shamanism, and they focused on Siberia. Now we see, for reasons apparently quite arbitrary, like mainly that they had a lot of ethnographic data on Siberia, there's no reason to hold the Hopi medicine man, the Amazonian ayahuasca and the Solomon Island uh, Kapu man up to comparison to a Siberian standard. But nevertheless, the literature preserves this. And so then the model or paradigmatic intoxicant of the paradigmatic shaman was Amanita muscaria. There are a lot of problems with this. Amanita muscaria is not a reliable intoxicant. It is subject to geographic variation, seasonal variation, genetic variation. There are toxins present in it that are also subject to variation. You can end up with an NDE rather than a hallucinogenic experience if you just miss the mark slightly with this one. Nevertheless, it is circumarctic in its distribution. It occurs in Denmark across the northern reaches of the Soviet Union, into uh, Alaska, and into Canada. And it's generalized in that range. As you move south, it retreats to higher and higher altitudes, uh, with certain exceptions. For instance, in California, it can be found at sea level in some ecosystems. Some of you may know you, uh, Baker's Beach. That's a beach that lies outside the Golden Gate Bridge in this very ritzy district of old mansions. Well, go on a rainy January day down to Baker's Beach, and there are a lot of birch trees and these kind of trees planted in sea old sea sand. And my God, this is an Amanita ecosystem that you will not believe. I have seen not only Amanita muscaria by the bushel and Amanita pantherina, but rare, rare Amanitas. The chocolate brown one, Porphyria, rumored to contain uh, beta carbolines, and uh, and uh, Rugosa, and the the deadly one, Barusa, the one they call the destroying angel. All of these amanitas can be seen within a half mile walk of each other. Specimens the size of dinner plates. So what this means, you see, is that people then moving south through British Columbia and on into the Great Plains and western coast of North America had been shorn of their phytoshamanic knowledge because they had just come through centuries and centuries of migration through hallucinogen poor environments. And to my mind, this explains the curious absence of major hallucinogens in North American Indian spirituality. North American Indian spirituality relies largely on ordeals, the Sundance ordeal, and this sort of thing. There are minor uh, psychoactives, such as a chorus calamus, sweet flag root, and there are, uh, but really, North American Indian shamanism is not a shamanism of hallucinogenic ecstasy. The use of peyote, which is might be offered as the counterexample, it's astonishingly difficult to document the use of peyote before just a few hundred years ago. I mean, we like to think, you know, that people have been taking peyote in the New World for millennia, but in fact it seems to be something that came up out of Mexico where the Tarahumara may have had it in a very localized culture complex, but uh, with the Indians in the western United States getting the shit kicked out of them by the U.S. Army, there was pressure for revitalization. And any of you who are anthropologists understand how this works. You put pressure on a people, they will launch revitalization movements. The ghost dance religion of the Sioux and Algonquin and Plains people was largely a, fun, a revitalization movement based on peyote. 
what appears to have been going on in the temperate Mesoamerican zone anciently was the use of Sephora secundifolia. And Sephora secundifolia is a highly poisonous plant. It is what we co what anthropologists call an ordeal poison, not a hallucinogen. Now, ordeal poisons are a, a, a rougher way to end up at the same place. The uh, place on Earth, for unknown reasons, or reasons not known to me anyway, where ordeal poisons have been perfected is on the island of Madagascar, mentioned earlier in this lecture as one of those sites where land has been above water longer than anywhere else on Earth. And on the island of Madagascar, the Malagasy Republic, tribal people have located a number of plants that are extremely temporary uh, poisoners so that you think you're going to die. You beg for death. And you don't die, you recover fully in 16, 10, 12 to 16 hours. But you are so, it is so agonizing, and you so completely wish for death in this experience, that when you finally realize that you're going to live through it, you have the equivalent of a psychedelic experience. I mean, you, sh you, tears of joy well up, you embrace the earth, you give thanks to God, and you come clean. But this is a tougher way to do it than most of us might prefer. Uh, sometimes you have psychedelic trips like that, where the fact that it is over is such cause for rejoicing that you hardly know who to thank. Uh, and apparently, apparently, uh, North American Indian shamanism tended in this direction. And only peyote arriving late mitigated that. And peyote still partakes of this to some degree. I mean, it is a minor ordeal, especially if you eat enough peyote to trigger truly intense hallucinations. What I've found sitting in peyote circles is most people only take enough to be able to sit in the circle without nodding out. And at low doses, of course, mescaline and amphetamine will wire you up. But it takes a lot to put you into Don Juan country. Um, and it is not an indole. It is a psychoactive amphetamine more closely related to the synthetic psychoactive amphetamines such as MDA and MDMA. But now we're on the brink of moving down into the, uh, into Mesoamerica, onto the Mexican peninsula. And we are approaching this puzzling concentration of psychoactive plants. It's a, it begins, basically, you could start your border at the Rio Grande, and it goes south to Argentina. And in that zone, there is a tremendous richness of psychoactive plants of all types in many plant families. Uh, I've mentioned peyote. I mentioned Datura in another context. Datura cults are very big, and Datura has to be viewed as an ordeal poison. It is a hallucinogen, but it's also a kind of, of uh, deliriant and a kind of frenzy-inducing thing. And it doesn't... It's very hard to take much out of it. You have intense experiences, but you're, you're, the perceiving mind has been somehow interfered with. Nevertheless, in Southern California, Catalina Island, San Diego County, in ancient times there was what was called the Tolach religion of the Luiseno people and people speaking that language group. And this was an adolescent initiation for males that involved being taken into the desert and given large amounts of detura over days. This would be a completely... Uh, boundary-dissolving, consciousness-altering experience. As we go deeper into Mexico and leave the deserts behind and begin to approach the, the mountain range of the Sierra Mazateca and the central Mexican highland, we come upon uh, what, in some ways, to me, 
is one of the most interesting hallucinogen and shamanic hallucinogen complexes, which is, of course, the central Mexican mushroom complex discovered by Gordon and Valentina Wasson uh, in the early 50s. Now, these are not mushrooms that grow in the dung of cows or any other animal. These are what mycologists call ephemeral, meaning small and diminutive, uh, and briefly uh, present as fruiting bodies, ephemeral mushrooms that uh, actually live in um, uh, very restricted ecosystems. One of them lives in the waste from sugar cane, so it can only grow in matted vegetable material. Some of them grow, the one called derumbes, the earthquake mushroom, grows only in disturbed land where there's like erosion or shifting. Uh, and clearly all of these mushrooms must have speciated from a common ancestor. They're about, well, it changes all the time, but there are about 12 varieties. All have been utilized. Now, interestingly enough, uh, in terms of fungal speciation, the center of fungal speciation in North America is around Grants Pass, Oregon. There are more mushroom species within a hundred miles of Grants Pass, Oregon than almost anywhere on Earth. And there are uh, psilocybin-containing diminutive mushrooms, not coprophytic. But nobody but the most... Um, inspired anthropologists have ever been able to find any evidence for use of these hallucinogenic psilocybin-containing mushrooms in the Kwakutl, Shimsham, Tlingit complex of peoples. They knew about, well, no, we don't know that they knew about this. Uh, one would assume, because we give Indians a lot of credit, that they knew a lot about their environment. And, of course, we have the evidence of their peculiar artistic style, which is X-ray vision. These are the people who show you the insides of things as well as the outsides. But in terms of usage or a claim of usage, it's never been substantiated. And this brings up an interesting point, because the plants I'm talking to you about uh, today are plants with a history of shamanic usage. But there are hallucinogenic plants without a history of shamanic usage. Plants that looked at pharmacologically look like ideal candidates. Why weren't they used? A good example would be um, um, in the Convolvulaceae, the, the Morning Glory family, there is a, a, a group... Uh, Argyria, 13 species of Argyria. They occur naturally from northern India to the Solomon Islands. They are woody morning glories. Uh, the one that you may know is the Hawaiian baby wood rose. Well, now, the Hawaiian baby wood rose is a very powerful hallucinogen, weight for weight. I mean, it only takes eight seeds of this thing to propel you into a fairly profound visionary state. Uh, there is, There are some cardioactive glycosides present, but as we see, these ordeal poisons, that doesn't turn people off in other situations. Uh, Argyria is unknown to have a folk usage. And yet, you know, looking at the flora of Earth, this is one of the first things you would think that people might have looked at. Uh, certainly, hippies in the 1960s and people since have made very good use of Argyria as a visionary vehicle. Rupert and I, Rupert Sheldrake and I, have talked a lot about this, about the morphogenetic field of a shamanic plant without a history of shamanic usage and how different that would be, say, to take Argyria nervosa and, and contrast it with uh, Strophera cubensis or something like that that has a tremendous input from past shamanic usage. Well, here's one that has none. Uh, with Argyrian... Well... 
I don't, I think it, ha well, I don't really know. We don't have enough data on Archeria. Nobody has done, you know, the Hawaiian Woodrose book to give us 30 or 40 accounts so we can see. Um, I, when I took it, I had a ex quite anomalous experience. Uh, it was a standard psychedelic experience, but the visionary uh, episode was entirely, and this was in a room in Berkeley, no pre, you know, no uh, suggestion. And what the contents of the hallucinations were is they were entirely based on the motif of the sea urchin. And I was in huge dome rooms that were pale purple with these star-like, things and these tit-like protuberances on everything and then this mauve floor and then what looked to me like it was the it was the pumpkin carriage from Cinderella but it wasn't a pumpkin it was a sea urchin vehicle of some sort was being drawn by these bizarre looking creatures they were like a cross between uh camels and giraffes and they too were pale violet and had these tit like protuberances all over their body that the little knobs you know on the sea i don't know I, nobody had ever said to me that hawaiian woodrows had anything to do with the sea urchin motif but it was pretty inescapable i i would have done more with that but uh i didn't like this cardioactive glycoside thing. What, in practical terms, what it meant was, in the first wave, you just had to sit down and tell yourself that if you were having a heart attack, you better get ready, because there was nothing you could do about it, and it certainly was convincing. I don't know, maybe there are some medical people in the audience. It's always good to have a doctor around, because they're so hard to alarm. You know, I mean, I'll be ready to bury somebody, and they will say, no, they'll snap out of it in an hour or two. This person is absolutely rigid and unconscious, and you're supposed to be calm about it because their pulse tells you it's all right. Well, anyway, to say more about Mexico, um, the uh, coincident with this Sierra Mazatecan cultural area where all these mushrooms are being utilized, there is a an overlapping and completely unrelated complex also of great age and richness. And this is uh, the hallucinogenic morning glory group, not the Argerias that I've just been talking about, but uh, morning glories in two other families, in the family Ipomoea and in the family uh, Turbina. The Ipomoea is the one you might be most familiar with. This is the heavenly blue morning glory that is the ornamental morning glory, an annual, and you can buy seeds in any decent seed store of this. It's been hybridized into three varietals, and it's amusing that they chose to name the original varietal, which was pure, pure blue. I mean, it is a, it is a magical plant. You don't even have to take it. I mean, just to look at this thing. And some of you may know uh, George O'Keefe's paintings of these flowers. Uh, uh, it's a pure, pure sky blue. That one is called heavenly blue. Then it was hybridized into a blue and white one, which is called flying saucer. And then it was further hybridized into a pearly white, which is called pearly gates. So heavenly blue, pearly gates, and flying saucer. And this is a, a wonderful uh, hallucinogen. It has everything going for it. You can grow up a bunch of them in a summer, a long summer. And it, the plant really responds to care and water. I've grown them in a single summer, 40 feet up a double garage wall, and just, you know, filled it. And then you let them make seed, and you cut down the the mass of dried foliage and seed capsules, and pound it over a sheet or a piece of plastic, and you know you can gather a, a thing like this full of seed, 
Well, it takes about 200 seeds to provide an unambiguous psychedelic experience. And one of the, uh, you know, you talk about morphogenetic fields. One of the really fascinating things about the Mexican morning glory seeds is the number of people who report Toltec and Mayan and Aztec imagery. And I have experienced this myself. It's absolutely uncanny. I mean, it's just, it's like being at Teotihuacan at the height of, uh, of uh, that civilization and the motif of the feathered serpent and the, all of this stuff is there. Now, I don't know whether this is su suggestion. I mean, other plants, I mean, when I took Iboga, I didn't think that I was in Africa. I didn't see the motifs of the fang. Uh, I don't know. This is an interesting area. I don't know how you do research in it. It's not empirical, but it is an interesting area. Why do the plants seem to have their own message? Um, the other Mexican morning glory uh, is Turbina coriambosa, formerly Rivea coriambosa, and it is not an annual. Uh, it's a perennial. It's a little bush with small white morning glory-like flowers on it, and it is a, it is quite powerful. With the Ipomoea, you have to take 200 to 300 seeds. With the Turbina, the ordinary dose is 13 seeds. And 13 seeds would barely cover the bottom of a teaspoon. So, you know, it's interesting that in the Convolvulaceae, the concentration of the alkaloid is really quite intense. Uh, and uh, turbina, both of these morning glories contain the ac active constituents are LSD-like compounds. Now, LSD, LSD-25, the classic LSD that we all know, is active in the nanogram range. In other words, uh, 200 gamma of LSD is considered a good dose. These naturally occurring ergon ergonamine and LSD-like compounds have a more ordinary dose spectrum. They are active in the range, even purified, of uh, 10 to 30 milligrams. This is more typical of a drug. The activity of LSD is uh, still a pharmacological miracle. I mean, I, you understand, do you not, that one gamma is one millionth of a gram, and that one milligram is one one thousand of a gram. A milligram, it takes a thousand gamma to make one milligram. So LSD is active in an unearthly intensity. This is why, you know, a guy could make six million hits in his garage, because the physical mass of it, the physical amount necessary for one human dose is literally uh, microscopic. Um, so perhaps the floristic coincidence of the two morning glories and the many mushroom species and then several minor psychedelics, which I'm not going to talk about today, in this Sierra Mazatecan situation set the stage for the evolution of such an intensely hallucinogenic uh, style of shamanism. And of course, those people then, and uh, anthropologists differ as to whether people entered South America by going through the Caribbean islands from the Yucatan and entered in the um, Suriname area, or whether people came down through the land bridge and across Panama and entered through Colombia. Current thinking is that they came through the Caribbean islands, that this was an easier route now, down through those Caribbean islands, what we find is uh, DMT cults using uh, the seeds of leguminous trees. In fact, the major source of, uh, of the snuffs of the Caribbean is a tree that, if you're not a botanist, you couldn't tell it from this. The tree is called Anadonanthera peregrina, and it looks like this in all particulars, except uh, the placement of the inflorescences is very, uh, uh, just a little bit different. It's a matter of detail. Um, 
in the deserts of northern Chile, uh, in the Atacama, Atacama Desert, they actually have found 4,500-year-old samples of DMT-containing snuffs. If any of you are interested in this, the anthropologist Manuel Torres and his wife have made this their life's work and have published uh, on this, uh, among others, a wonderful book showing the snuff trays of these Atacama people. And uh, they're beautiful, carved in wood, inlaid with shell and bone. They were the major high art that these people produced. Well, whether people entered South America through the Caribbean or in through Colombia, it's very clear that the experiences in Mexico gave them a complete shamanic armamentarium of uh, hallucinogenic substances. In the Amazon, what they encountered was the, the most floristically complex environment on the planet. Thinking is that human beings arrived there somewhere between 20 and 30,000 years ago, depending on the faction in anthropology that you align yourself with. What they found there uh, that they had not known before was Banisteriopsis copy, this uh, malfagaceous woody vine that can attain up to 200 meters in length which is, uh, you know, approaching 600 feet. I've seen specimens of this thing as thick as my thigh where it came out of the ground. And, you know, clearly a tree the size of this one completely shrouded and hung with it so that, you know, in estimating how much biomass you were looking at, you would have to estimate it in metric tons of material. Um, and what these people discovered about ayahuasca, uh, about Banisteriopsis copy, was that it was marginally psychoactive by itself. It was, uh, you know, an MAO inhibitor, but not an overt hallucinogen. But that they could combine it with plants containing DMT and they would become activated. Now, it's interesting that this happened at the, that this, technological breakthrough involved in the combining of one plant with another to create an effective drug happens at the end of this long process of cultural peregrinations and migrations. In other words, up until that time, so far as we know, there were not drugs. There were plants which get you high. A drug is where is a combinatory thing where the phenomenon that pharmacologists call synergy, the causing of one thing to become more active by being in the presence of another thing, is being utilized. And this was must have been developed rather late in the search for avenues to psychoactivity in the Amazon. What's going on there is that uh, DMT-containing plants either... Uh, Cicotria viridis in the Rubiaceae, or uh, Diploteris cabra reina in the Malfagaceae uh, in Colombia, are being added into these Banisteriopsis brews and are significantly changing the experience. Now, above and beyond that, a very complex folk pharmacology has been put in place down there using what are called tertiary admixtures. In other words, if Banisteriopsis is the primary ingredient, if Cicotria viridis is the secondary ingredient, then there are also tertiary admixtures. And the, this is a very rich area for uh, anthropological research because these tertiary admixtures are often uh, highly localized, also very secret. This is the personal part of a shaman's uh, uh, repertoire is his admixture plants. And if you can get these people to open up to you and share the identity of these admixture plants, almost invariably when you get them back into the laboratory and perform tests on them with Dragondorf's reagent and this kind of thing, 
They are alkaloid positive. They are chemically complex. In other words, these people, this is not a bunch of shuck and jive. These people have an extreme sensitivity to the presence of exotic chemicals in the environment, and they know how to track them down. And so it's been very fruitful in our work to spend a lot of time on the tertiary admixtures, and this and a lot of what we're doing in Hawaii. These are the things which are in danger of being lost. Ayahuasca, millions of people take ayahuasca in the Amazon. I mean, I venture to guess that it is the largest psychedelic religion on earth at this time. Over a vast area, this is going on. But knowledge of these tertiary admixtures is fading fast, and so are, so is the availability of some of the plants. If some of you are interested in this, um, write to my brother at the Stanford Department of Neurology. He published two review papers on admixtures to ayahuasca, in which the species names are given, the taxonomic families, and the identifiable chemical exotics are tabled there. And you can then see, you know, what a rich um, uh, selection of psychoactive substances these people have to draw from. And they claim, you know, that they say ayahuasca is not one thing. Ayahuasca is many, many things because we change it. We change it for the circumstance. We change it for the personality. We change it for the problem. And I've come to think that this is quite true, that there is a, an entire medical system there that, and, and so that's what at botanical dimensions, though we preserve all kinds of plants uh, and have collectors in Thailand and West Africa and hither and yon, we've really put our attention on this one medical system because the evidence uh, for its importance is the amazing balance, decency, dignity, and integrity of these people. And, you know, I'm, I am a cynic from a cynic's point of view. I do not wax uh, eloquent over the noble savage. And some of you have read my descriptions of my life among the Witoto, and I found them hard to put up with in some cases. Uh, it's not simply that if people are naked, they're beautiful. I mean, some naked people can be a real pain in the neck. But this ayahuasca complex is an ennobling folk way. Uh, these people have great heart and great um, sensitivity. I mean, they could get along fine at Esalen, these ayahuascaros. They are aware. You go into a village where this is happening, and the women may cluster around you, giggling, and uh, because you're so funny looking, all beet red and mosquito bitten, and hug tons of stuff on your back. The shaman sees exactly who you are. He is not culture bound in the same way. And in a way, this is a definition of shamanism. Shamanism is a person who, by some means, has gotten themselves out of their own culture so they can look back at it and manipulate its symbols, its beliefs, its expectations, its rituals to a an end. And of course, if it's a negative end, then you have magic, brujaria, sorcery, witchcraft. But if it's an end which serves and maximizes reasonable social goals, then you have true shamanism. Uh, <clears throat> In addition to the ayahuasca complex, uh, about which I know a great deal because I've concentrated on it, also in the Amazon, uh, there are uh, there is a subcomplex of the detura phenomenon. Oh, throughout the world, the deturas are bushes, but uh, as some of you may know, there are ornamental tree deturas that are a favorite with landscapists because they have these beautiful hanging flowers that shed scent in the evening. Well, all tree deturas originated in Peru and southern Colombia in the subfamily of the deturas called Brugmansia. These are the arborescent deturas. 
and they have an exotic chemistry, even in comparison to the bush detours. These are tropanes, uh, uh, hylocyamine, l hylocyamine scopolamine, and these are not true psychedelics. You may recognize the term scopolamine. The, this was the, the truth serum of, of Nazis in interrogation situations. And it really isn't a truth serum. It just causes you to dissolve your boundaries so, so thoroughly that you babble incessantly. And if someone's willing to listen and they know what they're listening for, you might spill the beans. But it, it isn't that you suddenly have a compulsion to tell the truth. If only such a thing were possible, who would need psychedelics uh, if there were a truth serum? Uh, the other complex that has been quite highly evolved in the Amazon, probably brought in by the uh, Arawakan-speaking peoples who swept through the Caribbean, is the snuffing complex. In the far east of the South American continent, the snuffing complex concentrates on leguminous trees, their seeds, Anadonanthra peregrina, Anadonanthra macrocarpa. Then those trees tend to, uh, they're not trees of the deep climaxed rainforest. They're trees more of the coastal and semi-arid regions. So as you go into the true climaxed lowland rainforest, uh, these snuff-using people had to find substitutes. And they very cleverly found a very excellent substitute in the form of uh, a family of Myristicaceous trees. The Myristicaceae is a family that includes nutmeg. Myristicaceous trees of the genus Varola. And they discovered that if you remove the bark of these trees before sunrise, uh, when the sap is still in them, you can strip off these long, narrow pieces of bark. And when you lay them on a low fire or a bed of coals, the exudate, the sap, will rise up out of the inner cambium of the bark and uh, bead up on the interior surface as what looks like blood. This is the resin of varola. And this is a broad-spectrum source of psychoactive tryptamines. DMT occurs in it. 5-methoxy-DMT occurs in it other psychoactive, cardioactive, and inactive tryptamines occur in it. And it varies from uh, species to species. And these varola trees are outrageously difficult to identify. Even a taxonomist who has made this group his special field of study requires a handheld 50-power uh, lens to make a species determination because the species are determined by these little hairs on the underside of the leaf called trichomes. They're little hairs which come up and then split in three ways. And by the angle on the dangle, you determine which varola species you have in hand. It was very interesting in 1980, uh, my brother and I and a botanist from UBC and a uh, fellow from Harvard all went down to the Rio Ampeyacu Yaguas Yasu drainage, which is just over into Peru from Colombia, specifically to study this um, varola complex because we felt that it was in real danger of being lost in a hurry, that this was the fragile one. Some of you may have um, know about the Waika or the Yanomamo or Yanomami. These are uh, peoples who use these varola snuffs, and, and the way you do it is you pack a tube, a hollow tube with the ground-up seed dust, or the in the case of the varolas, the ground-up resin, and someone blows it into your nostril with the full force of their breath. And it, it's like being hit in the side of the head by a log. I mean, you scream, you fall over backwards, you salivate. And by the time you've gotten back up on your haunches and cleared the mucus out of your system, the tube has been reloaded 
and they do your other nostril <laughs> then. And then you have an unambiguous intoxication, but it doesn't come anywhere near to being a DMT flash. Uh, the, this approach to the, to the grail of the psychedelic experience is difficult with botanical materials. You have to take a lot and you have to have the correct phytopharmacological strategy before you ever begin. To my, in my opinion, you can't approach the real center of the psychedelic experience uh, with psychobotanicals unless you're doing a fair bit of psilocybin or a fair bit of ayahuasca committed dose. Otherwise, you'll just slice low. Um, now, let's see. Did I leave anything out here? Well, I left out ergot. I'll say a little bit about it. Ergot is not used as a psychedelic anywhere in the modern world. Nevertheless, ergot is the source of LSD, and it is grown in Pakistan, not only of LSD. The reason it's grown in Pakistan is that ergonamine tartrate, which can be made into LSD, it has for many years, and perhaps still is, there are now competitors, but for many years was the preferred drug for migraine. Uh, and as a migraineur, I took a lot of it uh, years ago. Uh, migraine is a condition that is not well understood, but operationally what it is is a sudden uncontrolled dilation, uh, vasodilation that allows too much blood pressure on the head and intense head pain. Well, uh, ergonamine tartrate is a vasoconstrictor and just will squeeze your veins down to very small. And this is wonderful for migraine. You may have heard horror stories in the 1960s about people who took too much LSD and developed gangrene in their fingers and toes. This is possible. This is true. It's the it's the vasoconstricting aspect of LSD. It's not related to its uh, psychological effects. It is physically a strong vasoconstrictor. Uh, ergot may have had a history of usage as a hallucinogen because Gordon Wasson, Carl Rook, and Albert Hoffman argued fairly persuasively that ergot, ergotized beer, lay behind the Eleusinian mysteries. As you probably know, Eleusis was a cult site near Athens where every September for 2,000 years a great initiatory celebration was held in honor of Persephone's return from the kingdom of the underworld and the restoration to her mother. And uh, it was clearly a, a rite of hallucinogenic use of some sort, and Wasson Ruck Hoffman argued that it was ergotized beer. I question this because I think that there would have been more problems at Eleusis if it had been ergotized beer. Ergot is something not to mess around with. I mean, you could kill yourself in a big hurry with this stuff. And the notion that year after year, beer could be brewed reliably that would intoxicate several thousand people at these ceremonies, and there would not be any bad public relations about death or tremoring or convulsions causes me to wonder. Uh, the proof of the pudding for the Wasson-Ruck theory would have been go to the Eleusinian plain, gather ergot from the wild rye, and brew ergotized beer. I mean, why not carry these experiments out? If we're confident in our theory, the proof of the pudding would be to do that. I, I wouldn't touch ergotized beer. I'd want to see a liquid gas chromatogram and an infrared mass spectrophotometry data before I uh, knocked back a pint of ergotized beer. Uh, a small voice in opposition to this theory of Wasson, Hoffman, and Ruck was the English poet and uh, bon vivant uh, Robert Graves. He, be he believed that it was simply mushrooms, 
that it was simply mushrooms. And his argument for this was uh, he took the list of ingredients that was used in the cult. It isn't simply a list like you would do research and get the recipe. There was actually a published list of ingredients that was always, and the ingredients were always listed in a certain order. And one of the ingredients was water. And, uh, and Graves argued that it's crazy in a recipe for beer to include water because you know that you're going to add water. So he argued that these words were to be interpreted as an augum. Do you know what an augum is? An augum is when you have a list of words and you're supposed to take the first letter of each word in the list and it spells out a secret message. And Graves showed that the, the, the six ingredients always stated to go into the beer at Eleusis could be easily arranged so their first letters spelled out the Greek word for mushroom, mikos. And so he, he made that argument. Well, it's not clear either way. In fact, the Eleusinian mystery is quite mysterious because if they were mushrooms, all trace of them has died out and there's not, not unambiguous iconographical representation of mushrooms. We have a few Voss paintings where something small is being handed around, but to say with certainty that it's a mushroom isn't uh, really playing fair. Well, I, I wanted to run over this today with you and pretty much give it to you in one burst. There wasn't time for questions. I'll take questions on this, all of this data uh, at the beginning of the next session. This is really just to bring you up to speed. It's the kind of information that you should have under your belt if you're trying to make informed and intelligent uh, decisions about your own spiritual growth in relationship to these things. I mean, anybody who's interested in taking a new or an old drug, my advice would be the first stop is the library. You know, find out as much as you possibly can. It's going to mean a lot to you when you get out there in the billows because, you know, I mean, I've had experiences where the shaman said, take this, but never shake the bottle. So then I got, you know, Five years passed, and I'm trying to remember, did this guy say, take this, but never shake the bottle? Or did he say, take this, but always shake the bottle? Well, being a pharmacology, you know, having a background in pharmacology and ordinary scientific thinking, I decided, well, he must have said, always shake the bottle, because we want to agitate the stuff on the bottom and get it up into solution. Well, I'm telling you, pay attention. Because mistakes like this, if they don't kill you, they can scare the socks off you. It's uh, all in the details, you know. Um, I think we pretty much covered the waterfront. Uh, one last thought that I'll leave you with. I talked about the unclaimed nature of uh, the Argeria morning glories and how fascinating this is, how interesting it is to hypothesize possible hallucinogens possible combination that have never been used by people. Uh, an interesting one that was suggested just recently that I want to do research on and find out more about because I am puzzled by the soma problem and not really happy with any of the current answers. But um, uh, reserpine occurs in Rawulfia serpentina, an Indian tree. Reserpine is the first uh, uh, tranquilizer. It's possible that, um, well, no, it's pretty clear that reserpine works by inhibiting serotonin, that reserpine is somehow competes with serotonin for its uptake. So if you were to combine reserpine with pergamon harmala, or a psychoactive tryptamine, and there are some on the Indian subcontinent. One of the most interesting ones is Arundodonax. Now, this is a plant 
that really has a suggestive aura about it. We have no history of human usage for visionary purposes of Arundo Donax. Nevertheless, it is the giant river reed of the old world. To this day, the reeds for reed instruments, for clarinets and piccolos, comes from this plant. The very best ones are made from the roots, from uh, the shafts of the Arundo Donex plant. Well, the roots of this plant contain large amounts of DMT. Well, think about the symbolism here. Orpheus was a god of music. Orpheus was a flutist. And Orpheus made a descent into the underworld in search and of his beloved. And the so-called Orphic strain in Greek religion is the magical, mystical, extra-mundane strain in Greek religion. It seems to me entirely reasonable to suggest that the old, old strata of the Orphic religion may contain, uh, may be pointing us toward looking at Arundo Donax as a plant with a hallucinogenic potential whose, uh, whose efficacy was lost before the rise of literate Greek civilization. So I don't want you to think that all mysteries have been solved and all work has been done in this area. It hasn't at all. Uh, the flora of Africa the flora of eastern New Guinea, the flora of the Amazon, of Mexico, of what little forest remains in Africa, all of these areas may yield uh, astonishing tools for spiritual and shamanic exploration uh, when the cataloging and the phytochemical analysis is complete. There's a generation of work still to be done. That's it, folks. <laughs> You're listening to The Psychedelic Salon, where people are changing their lives one thought at a time. Talk about understatements. When Terence just now said that there is a generation of work yet to be done, he was uh, being unusually conservative, I think. I'd say that uh, we have many, many generations of work yet to be done. Just think of all the plants that Terence mentioned in this lecture. Each one of them, I think, needs to go through a whole series of studies, uh, like the ones that are now underway with psilocybin and MDMA, for example. Also, uh, every one of Sasha's tools should uh, go through similar testing. As Terence said, uh, while many of these substances will get you into a psychedelic state, no two of these states are exactly alike. Many aren't even similar to anything else. And that, uh, at least to me, uh, should be one of the most interesting and exciting areas of potential research. It could be profoundly important to understand the mechanisms that alter human consciousness in so many different directions. Let's face it, we humans still haven't even been able to come up with an agreed-upon definition of what consciousness itself is. Just think of what it could mean to our understanding of our situation here in these bodies if we could uh, find out exactly what places our consciousness in such radically different states. So uh, I hope that some of our younger saloners will consider careers that can help to solve some of these questions. Today it's uh, common knowledge that the brew known as ayahuasca is actually a complex combination of more than one plant. Everyone that has uh, even studied ayahuasca casually uh, now knows that. Yet it took a young man who went to the Amazon with his brother, not knowing much at all about what they were doing, but who became so curious about uh, what made ayahuasca work that he came back to the States, uh, eventually earned a PhD, and then did the scientific research that explained uh, what we now know about ayahuasca. And as you already know, that young man was Terence's brother, Dennis. Are you the next Dennis McKenna? As much as I enjoy listening to the words and wisdom of Terence, uh, the ultimate McKenna legacy, I think, uh, may turn out to be the scientific research of McKenna the Younger. <laughs> and uh, as an aside to you, Dennis, uh, I promise not to call you that again. <laughs> but, you know, it does have a really nice ring to it, don't you think? After all, uh, ancient Rome had Pliny the Elder and Pliny the Younger. A millennium or so from now, uh, some writer, I think, is going to be talking about ancient America and McKenna the Younger. <laughs> okay, I'll quit being so goofy. Uh, I'm just trying to uh, kill a little time to keep from having to once again update our fund drive donors about the status of their thumb drives. <laughs> 
First of all, the good news. All of the drives are not only here on my desk right now, but they have now all been populated with 400 podcasts and 128 McKenna sound bites. And I have to say that uh, when I hold one of those little devices in my hand and see that it's about the size of one of my fingers, I find it hard to believe that it holds over 500 hours of audio that also represents more than 7,000 hours of my work. Well, it just seems that they should be a lot bigger. <laughs> so uh, as soon as I post this podcast, then uh, my next step is to begin troubleshooting my printer so that I can print shipping labels for them. For what it's worth, uh, my printer hasn't worked for many months, so I don't anticipate a simple job of fixing it. Which brings me to where I feel that I should explain why I've been so slow in getting these drives shipped. You see, the story of my life has uh, been one of action without much prior thought. At times, I'm uh, like that man in the old Texas story who took off all his clothes and jumped into a big pile of cactus. When asked why he did it, he said, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> and uh, that's how I kind of planned our pledge drive. At first, I was uh, actually going to run a Kickstarter campaign, but then I realized that 99% of the donors to such a campaign are probably already here in the salon. So I thought, mm, heck, I'd like to have a thumb drive with all those podcasts on it myself, so uh, I'll make that a premium. And uh, that is the sum total of my thinking about it <laughs> until the campaign was already underway. Here's what I hadn't planned on. First of all, I expected that maybe 30 or so people would donate $45 or more and uh, they'd receive a thumb drive. That was my first mistake because, uh, well, around 150 people took advantage of the offer. And at first that seemed like a good thing, and it did turn out to be that way. But uh, I finally realized that PayPal doesn't forward addresses of people who make donations. So then I had 150 emails to send as asking for addresses. And you already know how I dislike email. And in case you haven't received one from me yet, uh, you still will. Uh, I haven't gotten them all out yet. But uh, I also discovered that Hotmail and uh, the rest of the Microsoft email providers have blacklisted my Matrix Masters server. And that means that uh, tomorrow I have to get a Gmail account and resend a whole bunch of emails that uh, came back to me so I can ask for your addresses. But wait, <laughs> there's even more to my lack of foresight. You see, I never bothered to estimate the size of the thumb drives that I'd need. My guess was uh, four, maybe five gigabytes. Guess what? The uh, 400 podcasts take up almost 14 gigabytes of storage. So my thought about a 8 gigabyte thumb drive size just got doubled, along with the cost of the drives. And then I discovered that to preload that much data would more than triple the cost of the drives, which uh, when combined with postage, and of course about a third of the drives are being shipped out of the U.S., well all those costs together would just about get me to the break even, with uh, not much left over to support the salon. So for the past 10 days I've been preloading the files myself. No problem, I figured. Again, I hadn't thought ahead, but uh, I then discovered that it takes over 35 minutes just to preload one drive. <laughs> you can do the math, but trust me, that was a lot of uploading. Now, all of this means uh, two things. Number one, the thumb drives, when you finally get them, have all been handcrafted, so to speak, by me. They are one of a kind. And should I have another fun drive next March, there most likely won't be any premiums associated with it, uh, but for sure there won't ever be any more thumb drives. This is it. And uh, I've still got at least two full weeks of email, printer fixing, label printing, and post office lines before the last drives are shipped. But eventually they're going to get out to you, so don't give up on me. We did have a very successful pledge drive, and the salon is funded through February of 2015. However, uh, the administrative functions that uh, followed after that fund drive are taking as much time as doing a couple dozen podcasts would take. And please don't feel sorry for me. <laughs> this has been my own fault for not planning properly, which is one of the main features of my life. <laughs> and the reason I'm telling you this is to embarrass myself so as to never do something like this again. Live and learn. That's what my mother always said. So I guess that's why I've managed to live as long as I have. I'm still learning. And for those valuable lessons, uh, I want to thank all of our donors, both for their patience and waiting for their thumb drives, and for teaching me another valuable life lesson. Who would have thought that planning ahead could be so important? <laughs> and uh, that's sarcasm for our fellow saloners for whom English isn't their native language. <laughs> but the best part of this whole long tale, however, 
is that with each drive that I plugged into my computer and began the upload process, I was able to connect with the individual who will be receiving it, from my hand to yours. And uh, that little warm fuzzy makes it all worthwhile for me. Again, I thank all of our supporters over the past nine years for everything you've done to publicize Islan and keep us going. I just learned that Benjamin Franklin published Poor Richard's Almanac for 25 years. And that seems like a nice milestone to shoot for. It'll be a stretch because I'll be 88 years old by then. But it's sure going to be fun to try. And for now, this is Lorenzo signing off from Cyberdelic Space. Be well, my friends.